Let's go ahead and get started. I'm Andrew Bennett. I'm the Forpin County Law Librarian, and today we are going to have our fifth attorney lecture series. And with us today is attorney Will Colgan, who's been practicing for a number of years here in Forpin County, uh, specifically in civil litigation. And uh, I will ask that everyone keep your questions till the end. This course is going to be on just general information. We are not going to uh, pass on any legal advice of any kind. Um, so if you have any questions, please hold them till the end. Um, you know, Mr. Colgan will be happy to answer those questions for you, but please keep it uh, not specific to your case. Um, try to keep them as general as you can, okay? So without further ado, here's Mr. Colgan, and thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, just by way of a quick introduction, Andrew's indicated uh, that I am uh, an attorney here in the Fort Bend County, and I have been practicing for a number of years. I'm looking at my license here on the wall. I've been licensed since 19, me, 1996. Had to double check that. So I've been practicing for a number of years, primarily in the areas of personal injury, probate, real estate, all of which can entail litigation. Um, so I'm, I'm very versed, I feel as though, uh, in, in litigation across the board. But it sounds today like we're going to be discussing primarily things along the lines of, of uh, general commercial type litigation. But I may kind of weave in other elements of my personal injury practice, my probate practice, uh, my real estate practice. They all kind of touch on each other, but they're all controlled by one body of rules, and that's the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure. And those can be found very easily, as most things can they, uh, these days online. Um, there is a book out there, kind of the Civil Litigation Bible. This is an older version of it, but it's called O'Connor's. And I know that Mr. Bennett has updated uh, and very recent editions of this book at the Fort Bend County Law Library. Um, O'Connor's is named for a judge, former judge by the name of Michael O'Connor. It's a female, M-I-C-H-O-L. But in the O'Connor's books, you can find the rules themselves as well as commentaries that explain how the rules are to be implemented. So this is a very, 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 very handy, trusty book to have. I have a number of versions. This is the one that I normally carry around with me. It's a little old, but it's got the basics in it. If I need something updated, then I'll get with someone like Mr. Bennett, who can steer me in the right direction. Another book, and excuse me, another book that I'll bring to your attention uh, this afternoon before we get started is, and these books are very expensive, so don't feel like you need to run out and buy these books in order to be successful if you're going to represent yourself. If you do, then great. Um, you probably will never, or hopefully you will never ever have to use it again. Uh, hopefully none of you will go through a lot of uh, litigation in your lifetime. Uh, but it's, the, it's a book called The Handbook on Texas Discovery Practice. This is a book that is very specific or is specific to discovery itself. And I'll talk a little bit about discovery in my presentation today, but I would suggest to you that if you get yourself or if you find yourself in a case where you've got discovery going on or that's being requested of you or that you're requesting of someone else if you have that level of proficiency, that might be the time when you might wanna consult with an attorney. Either one that you can find through legal service uh, uh, organizations such as Lone Star Legal Aid, there are some others around, or uh, maybe find an attorney that will sit down and do a consult with you. Uh, my office offers consults uh, for a small fee, and that usually comes along. Basically, you buy an hour of my time, for example, and I can prepare an answer for you or, or walk you through something. But I would suggest that if you find yourself in the area of a lawsuit referred to as the discovery phase, you might want to sit down with an attorney of some uh, experience in, in civil litigation. So I wanted to share those two volumes with you. A lawsuit has a basic, basic life cycle. So those of you that may be involved in lawsuits right now, I'll be happy to, again, uh, take questions uh, here in a bit and uh, address what I can. But just for those of you that may not be involved in a case or don't have the experience in a case that you might otherwise uh, wish that you had, 
Um, a, a lawsuit begins with the filing of what's referred to as a plaintiff's original petition. I call them POPs, P-O-P, -P, plaintiff's original petition. Is that a term of art? Is that a legal term? No, it's just something that I picked up from a friend a long time ago. It's a POP, because what's happening here is a person has made a decision to file a lawsuit against someone else or some other people or some organization or some corporate entity. Their intent is to literally pop that defendant, that's the person who's being sued, that's the name of the person being sued or the entity being sued, the defendant. And so that's kind of the, um, the imagery that one has when thinks of, thinks of a lawsuit being filed against someone else. Someone is going to show up on the doorstep of the person being sued, that person being a process server, who then has to serve the defendant with the plaintiff's original petition, okay? And then the defendant has an obligation to file an answer to that lawsuit within a certain amount of time. So that's the basic life cycle of a lawsuit. Then you've got your lawsuit up and running. So let me, let me back up just a bit and talk about some elements of the plaintiff's original petition and then the answer. The plaintiff's original petition, number one, does not always mean that what that plaintiff feels has uh, 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 or how they've been wronged, or what they're complaining about, or what they think the defendant is responsible for having done, just because they say it doesn't always mean that it's true. Now, there's always been a lot of talk about this idea of loser pay and people that file lawsuits that aren't successful in those lawsuits are going to be responsible for the attorney's fees of the other side, the defense, the other side or the filing fees, et cetera. We're not quite there in Texas, but we do have some rules that allow for certain punishments or penalties if a frivolous lawsuit is filed. And I can get into that a little bit more specifically, but that's going down a, a, a trail that does get a little, little bit procedurally uh, um, cumbersome. But just know that just because something is filed by a plaintiff to initiate a lawsuit does not always make it right, does not always make it valid, does not always make it true. So as an attorney, we have to be very, very careful or should be very careful. I can't speak for all attorneys, but I will tell you that the Texas Bar Association does expect us to review the facts of a case before we just run out and file something because the facts of the case may be overstated to us by our clients. Uh, they may not be legitimate facts. And there is an understanding that if there's a lawsuit that's filed that does have flaws in it or is not true at all, and then it is served upon a defendant who then has to go through the process of defending themselves against this potentially frivolous lawsuit, well, that's, you know, that's, that's, not, that's not justice. You know, that's just somebody filing something just to get under the skin or, of, of a defendant or, or to get somebody to spend some money where they don't necessarily need to. So just know that the plaintiff's original pleadings are expected to be well-reasoned, well-thought-out, and well-documented, uh, and well-researched before that lawsuit is filed. The plaintiff also generally has a specific amount of time within which to file their lawsuit, that's called a statute of limitations. A statute of limitations, SOL, is exactly what it's going to render you if you don't hit your statute of limitations. For example, bodily injury claim in the state of Texas, you have two years from the date of an accident to file suit in relation to that bodily injury. If you don't file suit within that, actually we're to the point now where if you don't file suit and have your defendant served within the statute of limitations, the plaintiff is going to run into some problems. Okay, so it's not just filing within the statute. Now, case law is out there that suggests that you also have to have your defendant served within the statute of limitations. So 
you can Google statutes of limitation in Texas and it'll give you pretty much everything, but bodily injury claims two years, credit card debt, uh, other debt, four years. And the reason I bring up credit card debt is I'll talk about credit card litigation on the defense side here in a bit, but credit card debt is a little bit weird because it's got kind of a rolling statute of limitations. It's not necessarily going to be four years from the date the credit card contract was signed with the credit card company. It's going to be the four years from the last activity on that credit card, either a payment or a charge. So these are things to watch out. I'll talk a little bit more about that sort of thing. But so there are burdens and there are responsibilities on the plaintiff side. But if they're able to overcome those those burdens and those responsibilities or uphold those responsibilities on the plaintiff side, then it becomes incumbent upon the defendant to do what they need to do in order to defend themselves. And uh, Mr. Bennett has indicated that that was kind of one of the uh, hot topics he wanted me to cover uh, today. And that is uh, what the defendant's responsibilities are gonna be if they are found in a lawsuit. And that first primary responsibility in, uh, in a lawsuit that a, that a defendant has is to file an answer. And that answer, generally speaking, needs to be filed within a certain amount of time. Now, things change from time to time, but where we are today is in your county courts and your district courts. If a lawsuit is filed in a county court or a district court, the answer is due on the Monday following the expiration of 20 days from the date of service. I know that's a mouthful. It took me forever to figure that out in law school too. So just kind of throwing that out there. Basically, the easiest thing to do is to think, if I get served, I need to file an answer within 20 days, okay? But what the rules say is, you take the day you were served, you count 20 consecutive days, not work days, but 20 consecutive days, and then you fall to the Monday following the expiration of those 20 days. That's when your answer would be due, okay? So it's not 20 days straight, although that's the way I would like people to think about it. Just file an answer within 20 days, but it, the rules say the Monday following the expiration of 20 days from the date of service. That brings up another quick point. One that when I do defend people, most of my work is done on the plaintiff side, especially my personal injury work. But I do defense work on civil litigation cases. I do plaintiff's work as well. But um, whether it's for a friend or a paying client or whomever, I do a lot of credit card uh, defense. Uh, there are plaintiff's uh, firms out there that are huge nationwide firms that do a lot of credit card collection. There's a lot of it going on right now. A lot of it is, is done in JP courts. I'm gonna talk about that in a bit, but um, you, just, you just need to be very cognizant of getting an answer filed. The consequence of not filing an answer is the possibility of a default judgment being taken against you, okay? Now, what is a default judgment? A default judgment is something that the plaintiff would request from the court if a defendant does not file an answer, okay? They tell the judge, they file a motion, which a motion is just a fancy way of saying a request from one of the parties in a case that the judge do something for them. A motion for default judgment. Judge, we served, I'm going to talk more about this here in a second. This is why I brought up credit card litigation and collection litigation. Um, judge, we served our defendant on such and such day. They had the statutory amount of time to file their answer and they didn't. We are now presenting a motion for you to grant a default judgment against them, meaning they didn't file an answer we're asking that the court grant us everything we've asked for in our original petition because we've given the defendant the opportunity to answer and, and, and contest things. They didn't. We gave them the ample opportunity. They didn't. So now, judge, you have to do what the rules tell us that you can do, and that's give us everything we've asked for. That's the reason 
that default judgment is the very reason that we have such what I would consider to be sacrosanct rules of service, a due process issue. And, I'm gonna, and this is why I'm talking about this, because I'm seeing a lot of this, particularly from a particular debt collector, which I won't give the name of. Um, but I fought two cases against this specific scenario. Okay, and both were, uh, one was in a county court here in Fort Bend County, and one is in a JP court here in Fort Bend County. What happened was credit card company or, or, or collection agency, one was a credit card, one was a, a lender, an online lender. It's not important. But the debt collector and their attorneys, the original petition was filed legitimately. There was no issue with that. Where the issue came in on one case, well, I guess the, the service was legitimate on both. So they were, du they were duly served if I remember correctly, they were duly served with the, um, with the lawsuit itself. One, the person was actually served with the lawsuit by a process server. On the other one, the plaintiff had to do this thing called motion for substituted service. What that means is they've sent a process server or a constable out. That process server or constable has tried three times at the last known address that's a confirmable last known address, and they weren't able to serve the defendant at that address. And when I say confirmable last known address, this is where things get a little murky because a plaintiff may have a, fo a former address, but the process server, the constable can't confirm that that's the actual address of the person that's trying to be served. And then they try to get this thing called motion for substituted service, which basically means a process server can go and just leave it on the front doorstep. Okay. And they're passing this off as good service. Motions for substituted service are valid. I'm not saying that they're not. I was about to have to use one in a case, but I found my two people I was looking for. But they need to be better investigated by the courts, is my opinion. I think the courts need to spend more time testing the plaintiffs that are asking for default judgments as to the procedures that they are supposed to follow before getting these default judgments and these motions for substituted service. So in those two cases, arguably the original service was valid. What came next, I was arguing, was not. The default judgment, when, when, the, when the plaintiffs went to the court and said, judge, we had them served, they didn't answer, we want a default giving us everything we've asked for. The courts are falling, in my opinion, are falling down on the job a bit. I'm not making, it, I'm not casting aspersions against the judiciary or the court system as a whole. I'm just telling you, I see this more than I'm comfortable seeing it. The default the motion for default judgment is not getting sent to the defendant that allegedly defaulted on their answer, okay? The defendant received their answer, arguably. That was valid. They had an, they had an obligation to file an answer. They didn't. The consequence of that is in the citation that you're served with. If you don't file an answer within the time frame allotted in this particular case, a default can be taken against you. So they're notified of the consequences of not filing an answer. For various reasons, people don't file answers. They stick their head in the ground, hope it's going to go away. COVID, busy, kids, it, things happen. Just know, though, that a default, you can defeat a default judgment from being signed by filing an answer up to the moment before the judge signs off on the default. Okay, so a motion for default is not always going to be fatal if the defendant knows that it's coming. That's the part that's the part that's not matching up in a lot of these cases. The defendant gets served, but after that, the plaintiff's motion for default judgment is not getting to the defendant telling them that, "Hey, remember the consequence I told you about before in my citation? It's coming." 
if you know it's coming, hopefully you'll do something about it that time. But in these two cases, I argued in what's called a motion for new trial that the defendant did not get adequate notice of the plaintiff's default motion or motion for default judgment. And they had a hearing on the default uh, judgment and the person still never showed up. So guess what? They got a default judgment taken against them. Arguably, if they would have known about the default hearing, so first and foremost, they're not being notified necessarily of the, def the motion for default judgment. Now, is that on the court or is that on the plaintiff's counsel? I would argue that's on the plaintiff's counsel to prove to the court at the default hearing that they got notice to the defendant. If they got service on the defendant, they've got, lo they've got the defendant's location, right? Just send them the motion for default judgment by mail or have a, pro a process server serve them with that. Then they've got that in their back pocket, okay? Um, subsequent to that, send them the hearing date on the default judgment. And then you've really, and then proof of that, and you show that to the judge, you prove that the person's not in the military, you've done all the things and checked all the boxes and, and crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's, then you should be giving your default judgment. That's all on the defendant. If the plaintiff does all that with the court's assistance and knowledge, then that's on the defendant. They had every opportunity to do this. So in these two cases, I argued to the court and I was successful that the, the defendant did not get adequate notice or, or information about the default, which eventually was taken against them. But I had to file my motion for new trial within 30 days of the default judgment. So I hope you see that there's a lot of minefields involved in civil litigation. Uh, criminal cases, there are minefields, but it's much more linear. You've got the state versus that type of defendant. The state is arguably supposed to turn over every bit of evidence they have against the defendant. And the defendant has a, a, an opportunity to defend themselves knowing everything that the, that the prosecutor has in their file, okay? That's also called discovery. And then the state is held to the highest level of, 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 of evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. That's the criminal side. On the civil side, it's a preponderance, okay? It's not, it's not that high level, it's a mid-level. So civil litigation can very, be very, very tricky. Um, it also gets tricky from the perspective of not only filing an answer, well, let me back up. I mentioned, um, I mentioned county courts and district courts, Monday following the expiration of 20 days from the date of service. Easier thought of file an answer within 20 days. In JP courts, it's 10 days straight, okay? It used to be the same kind of idea of a certain amount of time after the date of service, or it's the, a certain day after, the, it used to be like the county and district courts. Now JP courts are 10 days straight from the date of service. So if somebody gets served with something as a defendant in a JP court, then they better get on the ball pretty quickly and get an answer filed. People call me all the time and say, what do I do? I can't afford an attorney, I need an answer filed. I tell them, Get yourself, if it's a JP court, get yourself to the court that the case is out of, okay? There's going to be five of them around Fort Bend County. There's one in Needville. There's one in Missouri City. There's one in Stafford. No, no, excuse, well, it's roughly Stafford. There's one in Sugarland, and there's one in Rosenberg, and there's one in Katy. So they're not as far flung as the ones in Harris County. They're all over the place in Harris County. But here, they're not difficult to get to. You don't have to pay for parking. It's very accessible to get in there. They will allow you, if you go in pro se, you're representing yourself, they'll show you what you need to file as an answer. They're not going to give you legal advice, but they will show you what you need to file as an answer. Okay? They'll give you a form that you can fill out, sign, and at least you've got your answer filed that'll defeat a default. Okay? And then you have to take that answer and send it to the plaintiff that sued you so they know what your answer is. In county courts and district courts, it's a little bit different. Fortunately, he, here in Fort Bend County, our, our clerks are very accessible. They're at the courthouse still during COVID, unlike uh, 
a lot of what's going on in Harris County, a lot of the clerks are working from home, which makes things difficult. So they're expecting even pro se litigants to file things uh, electronically. And if you don't already have an e-file account, <laughs> you're going to have to open one and learn how to e-file which is not always the easiest thing. A lot of times it depends on the clerk on the other side of the e-file as to how easy or how complicated it can be. Trust me. Um, the bottom line is if you get sued and you don't have an attorney and you want to get an answer filed, just get something on paper filed with the clerk out of the, that, that controls the court that you've been, that your case is in. If it's in a JP court in Fort Bend County, it's going to be one of those five locations. Just walk in, say, I've been sued. What do I do? They'll generally help you. They'll give you a piece of paper. You can fill it out, fill in the blank thing, sign it, sometimes notarize it for you. And then they'll tell you, you need to make sure you get this to the plaintiff, okay, or the plaintiff's attorney. Then you can defeat, defeat a, a default judgment. Then the rest of the fun comes afterwards. We'll talk about that a little bit. If it's a county clerk or a district clerk, they are still accessible, but the staffs are smaller right now for obvious reasons. They're letting pro se's still file uh, uh, in person, but I have heard from some people that said that they went in as I suggested and they were told to e-file something. A lot of times <clears throat> I will let my staff e-file something for those people if they, if they need it, or sometimes I'll knock out an answer for them you know, just as a favor, um, enlist them on their pro se. So, but just make sure you get an answer filed to defeat all this default mumbo jumbo, because I'm telling you, we're, we're expected to be how to, held to the highest ethical standards in our profession, but not all of us practice that. I hate to say that, but that's the truth. I'm being recorded. It's the truth. Um, there's a small majority of us that are the people I'm referring to. The vast majority of attorneys do the right thing, know what they're doing, but like any profession, there are some bad apples. And I can't promise you who's going to be representing the plaintiff if you end up on the, on the other side of a lawsuit. Um, one other thing about answers, besides getting one filed, knowing where to file it, okay, the right clerk, the right place is very, very important, okay? The other thing is make sure that you file the right kind of answer. Now, generally speaking, a what's called a general denial will suffice. But, and you see this a lot of times in credit card litigation and debt collection in general, you'll be served as a defendant with something called a, 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 a suit on sworn account, okay? a suit on sworn account, which is a lawsuit that is backed up by an affidavit, a sworn affidavit signed by the uh, attorney sometimes, but generally by the attorney's client, be it a collection firm or an individual. And what the plaintiff is saying in that affidavit is they're swearing that the suit that's being uh, the, 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 excuse me, the account that the lawsuit is being filed on is valid, and, uh, and, I, and I'm, I'm attesting to that before notary, I'm swearing to it, okay? If a defendant gets served with a suit on sworn account, they have to file a sworn answer, not just a regular old answer. It has to be a sworn answer. Judges will be, they'll bend over backwards to assist uh, pro se defendants, and they may allow a corrected answer to be filed, but don't count don't count on it always. Okay, so if you see, if you ever see this thing called a suit on sworn account, then you need to know you need to file a specific type of answer, a sworn answer. Okay, not just a regular old default. Okay, so once you're able to get um, your default, or excuse me, once you're able to get your lawsuit up and running from a plaintiff's perspective and a defendant's perspective, the next phase that comes along, not always, but generally, hey, well, is, well, yeah. Before you get started, well, let's get on to a new Zoom so you don't have to be interrupted oh, okay. for the last okay. part of it. So I sent everybody an email 
um, you should get the new Zoom uh, uh, room, and then we'll be back here in just a few few minutes. I'll just uh, conclude with a, a few other thoughts, and then we'll talk a little bit about about evictions, and maybe a little bit about foreclosures as well, because those are very uh, hot topics right now. Um, back to the defendant's answers. There are other ways to complain about what has been filed against you as a defendant. Um, one of those ways to complain or bring to the court's attention uh, that there may be defects in the plaintiff's original petition is that they didn't file in the right court. For example, if someone is going to sue someone else about anything having to do with real estate, dirt or anything attached to it, it has to be done in a district court. No ifs, ands, or buts, okay? You can't file real estate litigation in a county court or a JP court, except for evictions, landlord-tenant issues. JP courts have exclusive jurisdiction over landlord-tenant issues. So if you're a landlord and you want to evict someone, right now you can file those suits and you're not supposed to be having hearings, but I'm hearing that hearings are going on. So I'm gonna have to, there is a, there was a, um, there was a, 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 whatever the number of the rule is, and I've got it uh, printed out here in my office because I'm researching some cases right now, but uh, the CDC put out recent uh, regulations that there was supposed to be a moratorium on evictions until after December 31st due to COVID and not displacing people, making people homeless and that sort of thing. I was contacted yesterday by someone who actually had a hearing in a Fort Bend County JP court. They sent me the audio of the hearing and they just wanted some help on getting someone out. And I said, well, they're not supposed to be having hearings right now until the beginning of the year. And they actually had a hearing. So um, I don't know. Another one was in a JP court in Harris County, uh, JP 5-1, Judge Ridgeway. They're off of, um, um, it'll come to me. Anyway, they're off the Southwest Freeway, um, off Gulfton and Chimney Rock. This was a, this was a commercial uh, landlord with apartment complexes, and they wanted to see if I would give them some guidance on appealing a judgment that was uh, rendered in favor of a tenant because this CDC guideline that has come out two, three weeks back, maybe a little bit longer, um, basically says that if you're a residential tenant, not a commercial tenant, if you are not a business, if you are a residential tenant and you can prove certain things that have prevented you from making rent payments relative to COVID, there is an affidavit that you can sign and file in an eviction proceeding that precludes the landlord from getting an eviction against you. Well, this um, commercial apartment complex, they were trying to evict a tenant who basically was thumbing their nose at the apartment complex saying, you know, I got my, you know, I've gotten my uh, stimulus check, I've gotten this, I've gotten that, and I'm paying other things. Uh, I don't have money for the rent. Well, that's not the real definition of what this, this affidavit is about. So she filed an affidavit. Judge Ridgway granted the affidavit, although the apartment complex thinks that she perjured herself. She's paying for her utility. She's paying for her car. As a tenant, you have one obligation. That's to pay your rent. I know things are tough right now, but You've got to, based on this affidavit that the CDC put out, that you sign under oath, you have to show that you've made some sort of effort to make good on your monthly rent. You can't just not pay your rent completely and pay for other things. That's not the way it works. So I'm doing some research right now to see if you can overturn those rulings based upon someone perjuring themselves in that affidavit that the CDC put out? My presumption is that the answer is yes. Um, quite frankly, knowing Judge Ridgway the way that I know him and having practiced in front of him, he's a tough dude. So the fact that he did not 
question that particular tenant further on the financial side of that affidavit surprises me. I wasn't there for the hearing, so I don't know. But things are different right now. Things are different. Andrew is at the courthouse every single day. I'm there occasionally. I used to be there every single day, but now all of most of my hearings are done like this with a client next to me or without, um, which make th makes some things easier, some things not. But the JP courts are kind of where the action's still happening. My guess is that Judge Ridgway decided, and I'm being recorded, so I'm not telling you something that Judge Ridgway did that was bad because it's his court. If they're having hearings, they're having hearings. I mean, you know, um, I was just surprised to hear that. But I'm guessing that he felt that under the COVID circumstances, he was going to give that individual the, the best fighting chance that that individual could get to get through this situation. Although you have this, this commercial landlord, this apartment complex, don't shed any tears for them, for, for them. They're making plenty of money still. So I don't, I'm not taking their side necessarily. They're just who contacted me through a family member, but they have rights as well. Um, so I don't know how that's going to go down. It's a very interesting case to me to see if Judge Ridgway will overturn his ruling based upon perjury from the tenant. My guess is the answer is going to be yes, because the times that I've been front in front of him, he's very diligent in questioning people on, you know, hey, judge, I need time to pay my traffic citation. Well, prove that to me. What do you mean you need time? Are you just not pulling my leg on this? Because he's a pretty straight and narrow guy. So anyway, that's interesting. But evictions are kind of like the Wild West right now. You, nobody's really sure. I've kind of taken it upon myself to tell people there aren't going to be any evictions until the first of the year. But I also tell my landlord clients, be very careful in what you try to do. Don't just run out and lock somebody out. That's never been okay. Um, and try to be sensitive to people's financial positions right now and do the best you can. But at the same time, you've got landlords who have mortgages to pay based upon the rents that they bring in. So then now is the landlord looking at a foreclosure. I don't want to add fuel to the negative fire that COVID has created worldwide, but there is going to be a financial crisis on this level, foreclosures and evictions coming at the beginning of next year. I, I'm, I'm almost sure of it. Um, how we handle that, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. But I just want to throw that out there. If you're looking to evict someone or you're wanting to keep from being evicted, Consult with somebody, maybe not necessarily me, doesn't have to be me, but find somebody that kind of knows the nuances of what's happening in these eviction proceedings right now. But those kinds of things, landlord-tenant issues, can only happen in um, JP courts. Probate matters can only happen in county courts. Real estate can only be done in district courts. Felonies are only heard in district courts. Misdemeanors are heard in county courts. Family cases are only heard in uh, district courts. And so I could go on and on and on, but you can, you, can, you can protest what's been filed against you as a defendant because maybe it's in the wrong court or maybe, uh, you know, it's in the wrong county. If you, you have to generally file not only in the right jurisdiction, but in the right venue. Your jurisdiction is the county in the state of Texas, is the county in which the action is happening, where an auto accident happened, where a, 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 a divorce couple it resides, where the real estate exists, where a person died uh, or owns real estate, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and a landlord-tenant issue, where the, where the address where the rental property is. The venue is the court within the county that you have your case in. So if the plaintiff gets the wrong venue, gets the wrong court, you can have it kicked out. If they have it in the wrong county, you can have it kicked out. If they have the wrong subject matter in the wrong court, you can have it kicked out. So there's other ways to go about it. So if you're looking to file a lawsuit, be very careful that you do it the right way. Consult with an attorney if you feel like it's necessary. As a defendant, certainly make sure that you approach it the right way and um, consult with an attorney if you feel like it's gotten a little bit too cumbersome for you. And then there, are, there is this thing, and I'll touch on it briefly here, this thing called discovery, which is the ability for one side or the other in a lawsuit to gain information about the lawsuit. 
There's written discovery. There's other forms of discovery. Not all cases have discovery. There are some forms of discovery that are a lot more um, aggressive than others. If you have any interest in that, I'll refer you back to the handbook on Texas discovery practice. You can Google this stuff. There's all kinds of articles online if you're interested in discovery. Most people hate it. It's very uh, time consuming. It's very mind numbing. Um, if you're in a case that involves discovery, it, it takes on a flavor of its own. JP courts. If you have a case in a JP court, discovery cannot be conducted without court approval. So that's very important. For example, let's say you're a defendant and you get served with some sort of collection litigation. Somebody's trying to collect on a credit card. And in that, in that petition, there is discovery in that petition because the plaintiff didn't think long enough about where they were filing. Well, you don't have to answer that unless the plaintiff gets court approval. So JP courts, again, are the Wild West procedurally and they're the Wild West um, when it comes to evictions right now. And I mentioned foreclosures, those are in district court. So I, I guess with that, I guess, Andrew, if you want, we can turn it over to questions. Let's see, yeah, that'd be great. Um, you know, I've got one question real quick before yeah. we open it to everybody else. You talked a lot about, um, especially if you're pro se, the need to file an answer. Uh-huh to need to answer regardless of, of what you've been filed against or what's been filed against you, I should say. So one of the things that we get a lot, um, and obviously we don't advise them one way or the other, is what if that lawsuit is frivolous? And we've had many people that are coming in and they're saying, oh, well, it's a frivolous lawsuit. I don't owe them any money. I don't. I didn't do what they said I did, all that stuff. And they choose not to answer. Why, okay. why is it still important for somebody to answer regardless of whether it's frivolous or not? It's important so you don't have to do a lot of additional work to fight off the default judgment. Um, and I'm glad you brought that up. And I was going, I, if it came up, I was going to address that. There, okay, I, early, early on in our discussion today, I referred to the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure. And that was in the Michael O'Connor book. And Andrew's got plenty of books like that at the library for anybody that wants to uh, take a look at them or you can find them online as well. But there is a specific uh, Texas Rule of Civil Procedure, Texas Rule of Civil Procedure 13, like the bad luck number 13, that deals with bad faith claims. And what you can do and what I would suggest is that if you feel as though something has been filed against you uh, frivolously or in bad faith, you, you file a general denial or a sworn denial if it's a sworn account. And if it's a sworn account and it's bad faith, the plaintiff has perjured themselves. So they're going to have additional issues they may have to address with the court. But Rule 13, Texas Rules of Civil Procedure 13, says that, I won't go into the exact verbiage of it, but basically it says that any person that, any person being any attorney or any individual plaintiff that files a bad faith claim and the court recognize it, recognizes that claim as being brought in bad faith after having it brought to the attention of the court by the defendant, they can penalize, impose sanctions monetarily and otherwise against those parties that bring the bad faith claim. So I would suggest that an answer be filed, a general denial or a, a sworn denial, and in addition to that, pl um, plea as an affirmative defense, Texas Rule of Civil Procedure 13. Um, a lot of times, we as attorneys, we get hired and we're asked to uh, send out what I call scare and dare letters, uh, DTPA notifications and otherwise, and you, your clients' collection letters or whatever. And I, a lot of times, a good way to shut that down is to tell, I've got one here in front of me where my client was hit with a DTPA notice letter. DTPA is the Texas Deceptive Trade Practices Act, and it's a pretty valuable tool if someone's done wrong, I sent out some DTPA letters recently on behalf of 
to it, a husband and wife that bought a home and the realtor, the seller's realtor put, I can't believe they did this, but they actually put in the MLS listing that all the, they listed a lot of things that were rep replaced and new. One of the things that they said were replaced and new was the plumbing. That since been determined to be completely invalid and a complete lie. So I sent them a DTPA notice letter because they, they were fraudulently trying to induce people to buy real estate lying about the condition of the real estate. And since it's a realtor, I also had my clients file a, a, a complaint with the Texas rules, excuse me, the <laughs> Texas Real Estate Commission. But this other client of mine got this DTPA notice letter, scare them and dare them letter from this other attorney. And I reviewed the situation with him and I told them, I'll just read it to you out of my letter. There's other stuff here in my letter, but my response to him was, Furthermore, I would suggest that your clients have perhaps overstated and or misrep misrepresented their claim to you and that should your clients proceed with their aforementioned suggestions of DTPA litigation, I am pre prepared to suggest to my client that he file a counterclaim under TRCP Rule 13 for any such bad faith claims brought against him and your clients. Having said that to the other attorney, the other attorney knows if he puts his signature on this lawsuit that he threatened, and I do have it found to be in bad faith, he's going to have some explaining to do. So I would never not file an answer. I would file some sort of answer indicating if you think that the client, excuse me, if you think that the plaintiff has done something wrong, indicate it in your answer. But don't, don't keep yourself exposed without an answer. That's just my own personal opinion. Because if you do, you're going to have to deal with all this other default judgment mumbo jumbo. You're creating more work for yourself because you may just get the case dismissed with an answer. Or you may, when I say dismissed, you may file your answer. And then the next thing the plaintiffs does is dismiss their lawsuit, preferably with prejudice. That means they can't ever refile it again. Thank you. And that actually answers that quite perfectly. Um, you know, we get a lot of client, a lot of, uh, patrons coming in here that think it's, you know, because it's not true, they shouldn't file an answer. Um, right. and, and it will just go away. Like you've, you've said before, and it, mm -hmm. and it doesn't, uh, my other question that I have, and I'll kind of open it to the other, uh, attendees here. One of the other questions we get quite often is dealing in a small claims issue, uh, coming from JP court. Uh -huh. uh, and, and as you know, there's a limit on, you know, amount somebody can ask for in a small claim suit. Um, so the question is, let's say they're a defendant, they've been issued and, and they want to appeal it and they want to go up to say county court. Um, when would be the best time to do that? Is there a certain amount of time period that they, that they have to appeal something like that? Yes. Um, I want to say, I, do, I have some experience in, 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 in appeals from JP court to county court. And so everybody knows, as Andrew has indicated, the appellate court for a JP court is a county court, okay? The appellate courts for the county courts and the district courts are the real courts of appeals. But the appellate court for a JP court stops the court of last jurisdiction for a JP court case, a case that is initiated in a JP court is going to be a county court. Okay. And we have multiple county courts here in Fort Bend County. There are multiple, uh, much more multiple county courts in Harris County. Usually if you're in a case and you've gone through and you're not going to get to an appeal until a judgment is rendered either a judgment from a judge or a verdict by a jury. Juries render verdicts, judgments are rendered by judges. Once the trial case is, is, is resolved with a judgment or a verdict, one or the other parties has the right to appeal it. And you'll see these uh, quite often in, in landlord-tenant eviction matters. And I've had, I've had a handful of these cases, I think maybe five appeals from JP to county court. Let's just say it's five. I would say that probably three or four of the five were landlord tenant issues um, because tenants find out, oh, I can appeal it. And then 
I'm going to get another bite at the apple or I'm not going to have to move out or whatever. Because if it's appealed by someone, the judgment is not allowed to be executed upon. Okay, whoever wins does not then have the right to do post-judgment uh, things that would allow them to collect on the judgment. Very important thing to remember. Just because, and we're talking civil litigation for the most part, we're going to be talking about somebody going after somebody else for money. Just because you win your lawsuit does not mean the judge has a cash register at his bench or her bench to give you the money that you just won. You then have to take affirmative steps post-judgment to collect your judgment, okay? You're not just going to get the money there at the courthouse that day. Um, it doesn't happen that way. So people are uh, more often than not, the judge is going to win uh, an appeal bond, a certain amount of money. And that ends our attorney lecture series on civil litigation as defendant. We would just like to thank Mr. Will Colt for us today. And it was a great uh, presentation. And we hope you join us next time.